With first person being the default perspective for some of the world's most popular games, you might wonder why that hasn't bled over into TV and movies, even ones that are based on video game franchises. From the motion sickness that many viewers would get from experiencing first person at a cinematic 24 frames per second, to the inherently stylized nature of a creative choice like that, let's dive into the best and worst examples of first person cinema, and we'll break down why some of them work and a lot of them don't. Before we start, let's lay down some quick criteria as to what movies and TV we're actually discussing, because there's not a lot of first person cinema out there. So we're going to be looking at any movies that include an extended use of that perspective, be it an entire scene or maybe a recurring visual motif. I'm not going to be including examples like Predator, where there's a handful of first person shots, but they're not really integral to the movie, though big shout out to Predator for being one of the most iconic uses of the first person perspective in cinema. I think that one's kind of hard to beat. Anyway. Onto the tier lists. So let's start off at the start with some early examples, keeping in mind that these were made before video games were a thing. This one is the oldest example I could find of first person cinema, and that is 1931's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Surprisingly, for being the earliest example that I could find, this one's really good. As Dr. Jekyll walks through this room, he looks at himself in this mirror, but there's no CGI trickery here because it's 1931. It's just some creative creative set design and smart choreography. So the mirror on the wall is actually a cutout and the camera is looking through that into a mirrored version of the room. That's where Dr. Jekyll's actor is acting like he's in the mirror you know, his job. Along with that, I think it's really interesting that the first person sequence has this really intense vignetting around the edge. I think both to represent that it's in first person, but also to limit the view. And that's for good reason. For people that get motion sick from specifically first person video games, a recommended thing to try is to bring down the field of view. So you don't feel that motion as much because you're cropped in and you've not got this really wide perspective that can be really disorienting. Orienting. So I think the choice to have that heavy vignetting is both a creative one, but also one to help the viewer not get motion sick. So this one's really simple, it's elegant, it's age of grace, it's going straight into A tier. Jumping forward a few years to 1947, Dark Passage is often cited as one of the oldest significant examples of first person cinema. Vincent Parry, who is a convicted murderer, escapes from prison and tries to evade detection from both the police and the public. Sentenced for life for the murder of his wife three years ago. Well, what do you know? This leads him to eventually visiting a plastic surgeon to change his face. And that's where our point of view sequence ends. The first half hour of this movie, actually, is entirely in first person, which is pretty significant for the time. Interestingly enough, there's another one that came out the same year that does a very similar thing, but we'll come back to that later. Here, the choice to be in first person for those first 30 minutes is to obscure Vincent's original face, the one that we don't get to see. There's no mirrors, there's no reflections. Once he's gone under the knife, then it returns to a more traditional shooting style, where we we see plenty of his face. It's an interesting way to obscure his original face from the audience, but unlike in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the close framing feels claustrophobic rather than helping the viewer to shake off that motion sickness. To me, at least, it feels more dizzying than if it were wider. The camera work here is nothing exceptional, nothing to write home about, but I think it's still a fun watch if you're into the classics, which not everyone is but I'm gonna put this into C tier. Staying a little retro, we're gonna look at an episode from MASH in 1972, which was a very popular military sitcom. Pierce? This episode, which is called Point of View, funnily enough, is from the point of view of a soldier in the battleground. Unlike the show's typical lighthearted fare, there's a lot fewer jokes and a distinct absence of a laugh track in this episode. It's a lot more serious than what viewers probably were expecting to see on their, I don't know what night this aired on, but you know, Friday night TV. Compared to the examples that we've spoken about so far, MASH uses the camera a lot more interestingly, using movement to indicate that the character is speaking or gesturing to get us really in the shoes of our perspective character here. Right at the start of the episode, he loses his voice from an injury, so 
we don't hear him speak aside from a couple of lines right at the start. This is where moving the camera to nod or shake his head or to look around the room makes it feel like you're there more so than the previous two examples anyway. While I am praising that part of the camera work, a lot of it is kind of boring, just sitting in a room and talking without much movement. So I kind of think it balances out. So I'm gonna put this one into B tier. Now we're gonna jump forward to some more contemporary cinema with movies that feature point of view sequences, but for the feature length first person stuff, we're gonna put that towards the end because that's where it gets fun. Next up's probably the weirdest one on this list. It's based on a Stephen King novel that I haven't read, so I don't know if it's a good adaptation or not, but the movie's awful. It's 1992's The Lawnmower Man, and yeah. At the start of the movie, there's a lot of the sci-fi overlay stuff, kind of like Predator, but it's representing the view of a Robocop monkey. Later in the film, they dive into the 90s idea of virtual reality, which of course has some weird first person CGI shots that are very disorienting. F tier for this one. It's awful. Don't watch it. Okay, how about a Robin Williams film that you almost definitely have not watched? And it's kind of for good reason, but it is interesting. So let's get into it. 2004 is the final cut stars Williams as a cutter, a video editor, but for people's memories after they've died. All the memories in this film are shot from the first person perspective, probably unsurprisingly. And it's graded with this soft, dreamy aesthetic, which I think is thematically very appropriate for memories. That being said, the memories are all shot rather plainly and unimaginatively. Spare for one or two shots where the memory looks away from some blood and guts to sort of creatively obscure it. Not amazing, going into C tier. Okay, real FPS fans have been waiting for this one. You clicked on this video and you're probably thinking about it. It's 2005's Doom movie. Yes, it is bad. It is a bad movie. But I think the first person sequence is executed pretty well. So the perspective camera moves through a series of rooms and corridors, shooting a bunch of bad guys. Very generic shootery stuff. It's not themed, very doomy, which thumbs down for that. But the movement itself is really smooth and pretty easy to follow, but still has that bit of shake that does remind you that it is meant to be a perspective view and not just, you know, a magical camera flying through. That being said, most of the sequence is kind of boring. It's just generic action slop until we get to fight this pinky, which is based on the Doom 3 style, which I know a lot of people don't like, but that's a separate video. And it's definitely the most Doom thing in this sequence and probably the entire movie. Is it great? No, but I think it's very easy to watch. It's very well executed. And so it's gonna go into B tier. So jumping way forward to this year, we've got this awesome scene from Bad Boys Ride or Die. While the sequence isn't entirely in first person, it's going straight into S tier just for this badass camera rig that Will Smith is wearing where it flips back and forth. The sequence as a whole is brilliant. So S tier. Before we get to the good stuff, let's talk about some movies that are mostly in first person. Let's start off with 2007's French drama, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, or Les Sapandeurs et Le Papillon. I am so sorry to anyone that speaks French. Even if you don't speak French, I'm sorry that you had to hear that. We take the perspective of a man diagnosed with locked-in syndrome. His body is physically paralyzed, but his mental acuity is untouched. The first half of the movie is viewed through Jean Do's eyes, with the camera remaining mostly static due to his paralysis. While I've criticized other movies on here for having framing that's too tight and that feels too claustrophobic for the first person experience, I'm gonna change my tune here. The choice is more deliberate in this case. The camera remains tilted to the left with pretty narrow framing. Scenes blocked out in such a way that characters will have the top of their head cut out for frame or be talking over there where Jean Do can't see them. And that's really to create a sense of claustrophobia and helplessness to make the viewer empathize with Jean Do's condition. I honestly really, really like this one. So that's going into A tier for me. Sticking with foreign language picks, Su River. 
is a Chinese romance noir film set in Shanghai. An unnamed videographer is hired to record an aquatic performer and the two quickly fall in love. While the film does jump through a few different perspectives, the entirety of the videographer's story is viewed through his eyes. He's never revealed or named. There's a lot of hard cuts in this one that I think are interesting, but are probably going to be a little bit off-putting to most viewers. But the camera movement always feels really natural without being too claustrophobic or too fish-eyed or too smooth or way, way too blurry. I think this one's pretty much perfectly well executed, though it's very straightforward. But if you love your romance dramas, I highly recommend this one. It was a really enjoyable watch. So that's gonna go into A tier. And before we get into the fun section, we've got one more that is almost entirely point of view, but not entirely. So it stays in this section. And that is 2017's Kill Switch, a sci-fi action flick that there's like quantum energy being harvested on Earth, but they're harvesting it from like a parallel universe Earth that's also harvesting quantum energy from our Earth. Both of them are gonna blow up if they both keep doing it. So the guy from our Earth goes to blow up other Earth and then the guy on other Earth wants to blow up our Earth. Sounds fun. Movie sucks, honestly, but all the point of view stuff is done really, really well. There wasn't a single moment where the camera hit me with a dizzying or confusing movement. And the dialogue scenes actually work really well. There's usually a good combination of interesting sets, good lighting, and engaging performances from the actors. Though note that I say engaging and not good. They're corny, schlocky, but perfectly appropriate for this sort of B movie. I think calling it a B movie is generous. Based on all those things I just spelled out, it would probably go into A tier, but the sound design is really, really off-putting. It sounds like a first year uni student mixed it, and I'm allowed to make that joke because I did that. Uh, I still cringe thinking about it. You live and you learn. Anyway, back to Kill Switch. One of the choices I think is very interesting, but also bad, is that they mixed the perspective character's voice to sound kind of the same that you hear your voice in your own head. And that's with more, more bass and more resonance. But in Kill Switch, it makes his dialogue just sound kind of muddy and gross. Michael, nobody was supposed to have been copied. No living thing. This other thing that I think is really important for first person perspectives is having a good sense of stereo range. And there's none of that in Kill Switch. Honestly, it sounds like it was mixed to a mono track, which kind of kills the point. Stuff that was really far away sounded really close and vice versa is just a whole mess. Hey! It's me! What the fuck is wrong with you? And for that, it's gotta go into C tier. But with that out of the way, we can get to the fun stuff. All the movies that prompted me to make this video are in this section. I'm very excited to talk about a couple of those. These are all movies that are entirely in the first person perspective. And executing this for the entirety of a feature length film is not easy. Let's get into these. First up, we've got a combo piece. I mean, the combo piece really. And that's Cloverfield and the Blair Witch Project. And you might be wondering why I'm putting those two together because they're pretty separate. They came out like 10 years apart, but they're probably the most famous examples of the found footage genre. They're both pretty definitive works. These sort of pseudo documentaries that are shot on a handy cam give a very grounded and realistic tone that scares you in a different way to how traditional horror filmmaking does. Controversial opinion, I think The Blair Witch Project is really difficult to watch and maybe more than the creators had originally intended. The old camcorder scan lines and the really dizzying motion blur is meant to put you on the ground with the other characters and disorient you in the same way that they're feeling disoriented. To me, a lot of it comes across as a little too intense and makes it a bit too difficult to follow along with a movie, which then takes away from the horror, right? If you're too confused to be scared, then there's something not quite working. Despite my grievances with it, the world loves it. It's a massive success. So I'm gonna put my own opinion out on this one and uh, that's going into A tier. I much prefer Cloverfield. I think it's much less janky than the Blair Witch Projects, and a lot of that is given it came out 10 years later. So it's a lot easier on the eyes. But that's not to say that it doesn't use the first person perspective in the same way that the Blair Witch Project does. There are plenty of moments that 
You have the motion blur obscuring some details or the cameras left on the ground in the scuffle. It is still using that first person perspective to immerse the viewer very much in the same way that the Blair Witch Project is trying to. I just think it's executed better here. I should also quickly note that the Blair Witch Project is a horror movie and Cloverfield is more a disaster movie. But what I mean by trying to scare you in the same way is it is using the same first person filmmaking techniques to evoke the similar emotions, but in different contexts. I'm gonna put that right at the top of A tier. Now for the real, real FPS fans out here, we've got First Person Shooter. There's a concerning number of movies released under this name. This one in particular came out in 2014. It's awful. The camera sways in a manner that is really stable, feels like you got the stock Unity code for idle camera shake that, to me, is actually a little dizzying rather than immersive. All the first person elements are just composited on top of the shot really, really badly. And much like Kill Switch, the sound design is horrendous. Also, this movie is so ugly that it makes me consider playing Hellbound, which if you haven't heard me complain about that one, video over here. It's a weird one. Rank them using dating analogies. Kind of feels weird, but I'm too committed to the bit. I was going through some shit. Anyway, FPS is going into F tier. But for a palate cleanser, let's do one of my favorites. It's Gaspar Noe's Enter the Void, a Tokyo drug deal that goes wrong and we get to witness a DMT-fueled death from the first person perspective. Warning, it is a weird one and tackles some heavier themes. I really like it and I recommend watching it. Something I really like in this movie is the use of digital blicks that are used to hide cuts so they can simulate a continuous take, but also to subtly show the passage of time, like when he's walking down the street and he blinks and then he's quite a bit further down the street. So you don't have to watch him walk all the way, but you also don't get a hard cut that is rather jarring. And I think that's really, really interesting. I am a very, very big fan of this one, so it's going into S tier. Let's jump back to that movie that I mentioned at the start of the video. Interestingly enough, there's another one that came out the same year that does a very similar thing, the noir adventure, Lady in the Lake. And it's a bit nothing, it's a bit meh. <laughs> now, it was certainly novel at the time to have a movie that was presented entirely in first person, but the camera work is often janky and rather unpleasant to watch. Beyond that little bit of novelty factor, there is nothing novel here. Pretty standard. It's no better than Dark Passage, so it's gonna go in the same place. On a lighter note, let's talk about the British comedy show that is all in first person, though from various different first person perspectives. Peep Show ran on BBC4 until 2015 and everything is shot from the characters' perspectives. The awkward pauses and dry humor are really emphasized by having the characters looking directly into your eyes as they wait for a response. Well, I think it's really well executed throughout the show. At times it feels so standard, it might as well have been filmed with your typical shot, reverse shot. Because of that, I'm just gonna put it in beats here. It's good, but not great. Before we get to my like absolute favorite movie on this list, we've got a really, a split one. On one hand, Pandemic's execution of the POV camera work is almost perfect. The ideal balance of wide and steady enough to see clearly, but still narrow and shaky enough that it feels like real motion. Their choice of lens changes between scenes instead of being the same throughout the movie, which means interior sequences that are not meant to be claustrophobic don't feel claustrophobic. And when it's meant to be claustrophobic and scary, it feels appropriately so. And that really works to emphasize the tone of each scene rather than all of it feeling like the same sort of perspective. Yeah. On the other hand, whoa, this movie's bad. But like I've said to the other ones, not here to rate them on whether they're a good movie or not. We're talking about their execution of the first person perspective. And this one's pretty damn good. So it's going right to the top of A tier, honestly. For the grand finale, my favorite movie on this list and one of my favorite movies of all time and probably the movie that you thought about when you clicked on the thumbnail, at least if you were thinking of a good one. 2015's Hardcore Henry is a movie that I was very invested in long before it came out.
Directed by Ilya Naishalo, frontman of the Russian band Biting Elbows, the idea originated from the band's 2011 music video, The Stampede, a Hitman-esque first-person action romp that was shot through the very trendy at the time GoPro. The team expanded on the idea a couple years later with Bad Motherfucker in 2013, and there's a good chance that you've seen this. Naishalo then went on to write, direct, produce, and shoot Hardcore Henry on a $2 million budget. And much of that budget was used to develop and revise this assembly that they used to attach the GoPros to the actor slash cinematographer's head. Enough waffling about the history and the context. This is the most badass movie I have ever watched and I will not hear otherwise. Despite the movie being pretty much non-stop action, there is never a point where it feels disorienting or overwhelming. Every single shot just works. Part of that is the assembly that they use to attach the GoPro to the actor's head, which instead of using springs or elastic, uses magnets to stabilize it, which is kind of cool. Ilya Naishalo himself said that out of all their testing, that was the one that looked the most natural to him. And I agree, the movie also has really, really great visual effects on such a small budget. And amazingly, a lot of this shit is done practically with this crazy camera rig on the actor's face. It is absolutely insane to see. And if you haven't watched this, go watch it. It is so good. It is one of those movies you can sit down and you just be like, Holy shit, they actually made this. Anyway, that is my tier list of what I think are the most interesting examples of the first person perspective in cinema. There are some examples that I could have put in here that I don't think are that interesting, like Ready Player One, a movie that is very much about video game fan service -y bullshit, it has like three first person shots and they're all in like the first 10 minutes of the movie. Crazy choice to me, don't know what the deal is there, but let me know if there's anything that you think I should have spoken about more, or if you think my rankings are fucking stupid, which honestly, uh, yeah, the ones that I had written in the script, I changed while I was shooting, because I was like, no, that's stupid. Thank you for watching. Uh, you can check out some other videos that YouTube thinks you'll like here. I'll see you in the next one. Next month's video is gonna be fucking crazy. I'm very excited. Peace.